Hello folks. In this video, I want to cover the difference between primary and secondary sources. Uh, I'll also describe examples of primary and secondary source materials, and uh, I will also briefly review where you may want to look for primary and secondary source materials. Uh, as a disclaimer, this is a video for the students in uh, three of my different classes to which I've assigned uh, research paper projects. And all of them, of course, are from uh, different institutions. So some of the examples that I present here are largely relevant to those who are taking my Mexican, US, and Chicana, Chicano, Chicanx history courses. Uh, in particular, the students in my classes must pursue research topics from various perspectives, such as, uh, such as from race, gender, sexuality, class, colonialism, imperialism. Uh, some are also exploring uh, transnational influences. So uh, the suggestions that I throw out here uh, reflect some of those themes. And uh, just a, another note is that if you're already familiar with what uh, primary and secondary sources are in the discipline of history, you can, of course, skip this lecture. Uh, however, if you are unfamiliar or not sure, I strongly suggest that you watch this. Uh, not all students who are enrolled in my history courses are necessarily all history majors. So I don't want to assume that everyone knows the, the, the difference between a primary and secondary source uh, in history. Another reason I'm making this video is for history students that for whatever reason, their instructors never bother telling them the difference between a primary and secondary source. Most will assume that you already learned uh, the difference in your other classes. Still, unfortunately, even in my upper division courses and in my graduate courses in history and in history related topics, I always find uh, that there's a group of students who are unaware of the difference between a primary or secondary source. Again, I don't mean to shame anyone for this misunderstanding. Uh, what I want to do is point out that this is not the fault of, not just your fault, but this is the fault of us, your instructors, for not pointing out the distinction in the first place. So now that that's cleared up, uh, let's begin with the lecture. For starters, let's talk about what a primary source is not. A common misconception I see students having about primary sources is that they think it's a journal article, book, or a chapter that they're using for their research project that they think is the most important or most relevant to their topic. However, this is an incorrect definition of a primary source. In academic research in the humanities and social sciences, articles, books, theses, and dissertations, these are not primary sources. Those are secondary sources. So what then are primary sources? I like the following definition of primary sources from Furman University, which I will also link in the description box below. Uh, as they state here, quote, primary sources are firsthand contemporary accounts of events created by individuals during that period of time or several years later, such as correspondence, diaries, memoirs, and personal histories. These original records can be found in several media, such as print, artwork, and audio and visual recording. Examples of primary sources include manuscripts, newspapers, speeches, cartoons, photographs, video, and artifacts. Primary sources can be described as those sources that are the closest, that are closest to the origin of the information. They contain raw information and thus must be interpreted by researchers. Okay, uh, so next I want to cover some examples of these uh, that are mentioned in this slide. And I'm also gonna be throwing in other examples that I feel are also relevant. But before I continue going on with some of these examples, I wanna talk about, okay, so where can you go to look for primary sources in the first place? Now, uh, for most of us, right, uh, our, most of our university libraries have databases where we actually can search for primary source materials. Uh, so for example, some universities have OneSearch and the OneSearch option does have tools in place uh, that will allow you to search for primary source materials. But again, uh, the process of, look, of, uh, of sorting that tool, it varies by institution. So uh, again, I would strongly suggest that you investigate that uh, on your own time uh, to figure out what the university libraries, um, what their methods and procedures are. Uh, other things to keep in mind is that uh, universities uh, often have their own archives where they keep historical documents. Uh, so just as an example here at Cal State Northridge, uh, Cal State Northridge has their own special collections and archives department. The same goes for Arizona State University, Cal State Dominguez Hills. Okay, so I just wanted to emphasize that if you're in case in case you wanted to look at primary source documents held locally at your university, you can schedule something with the archivist. Other things to look out for is that sometimes university libraries, they might have digital collections of whatever it is that uh, whatever documents they have. Uh, 
in-house. So if, if like, let's say if you wanted to do research, but you don't want to go to campus, uh, maybe you could search their digital collections. So for example, uh, this is uh, from Cal State Northridge's webpage. Okay, so they, here they describe uh, digital collections that they can, that they have, you know, including documents, photographs, oral histories, uh, etc. Um, and outside of the university archives, of course, you can explore and go see what other archives uh, are out there outside of the university that house historical documents. You know, so for example, I'm just thinking here in Los Angeles, for example, um, a very accessible archive I've been able to go to locally here is by uh, the USC area, um, and I think it's the Southern California Library. Uh, and so. Anyways, the idea is here is that depending on what documents you're trying to look for, um, you know, maybe one thing you might want to investigate is if there's a local archival repository close to you where you might want to go do uh, uh, research. But if that's not uh, the way you want to go, you might also want to consider looking at uh, digital archival materials. So, for example, Library of Congress website, or perhaps um, I also have a database that I'm sharing with the, the students in my Chicano, Chicano Chicano Studies courses to look for uh, primary source materials that are that have been digitized. I'll actually also include that in the, in the description below of this video. Uh, another thing you might want to consider is uh, if you don't want to go to a physical archive um, uh, or uh, if you don't feel like looking at what's out there digitally, another option is to look at published primary sources. So these are sources that have been uh, transcribed uh, from the original document and it was put into book format, and in some cases, they've been put into article format. Uh, so a classic example uh, in US history uh, is the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, okay, who was a, an abolitionist. So that might be one route you might want to look at, looking if maybe there's published primary sources that you might want to look at to conduct your research. There's also the option, of course, of citing museum artifacts as your primary sources, depending on what your topic is. And another thing, right, uh, that you might want to consider is doing a Google search uh, to get a sense of what is out there. Depending on what your topic is, I may not have tips, right, for where you might be able to look for primary sources immediately. Uh, I might have ideas, but uh, again, you'll probably you will definitely have to do some research on your own, perhaps outside of the university library databases. Maybe look at Google, see if maybe there's some digitized primary sources relating to your specific topic. Uh, so in this set slide, you can see an example of some of these uh, primary source databases that I've listed, that I've collected thanks to the help of many colleagues and thanks to Twitter historians who ad helped uh, add to my list here. Uh, but uh, just to get you a sense of the types of digital documents that you can find out there, you know, I know that many of these are relevant to Chicana, Chicana, uh, Chicano, Chicanx history and also uh, Mexican and Mex uh, Mexican history and uh, Latinx history. Th regardless of what your topic is, you might find something similar uh, relevant to your field. So, for example, here in some of the sources that you see listed, you could see, for example, there's oral history repositories such as the Bracero Oral History Project. Uh, at uh, UTEP here that's listed on the left side. Uh, some other highlights, folks that publish various newspaper databases available for y'all to access, uh, or perhaps you might find uh, a conference proceedings uh, that are relevant to an organization you're studying. So for example, at the bottom left, uh, you might see uh, the Knox Annual Conference Proceedings. Uh, that's for the National Association of Chicana and Chicano Studies. Uh, on the right side, uh, there's even a source here that might be relevant for those of you all who might be interested in doing colonial Mexican history. So there's the Relaciones Geográficas, which are um, the geographic surveys uh, of New Spain. Uh, that, and uh, I believe that most of the ones that they have here are relevant to the Central West uh, Mexico region. Uh, and some of them, uh, they do have translated into English. So again, right, uh, feel free to take a look and scour these and perhaps consider using uh, them if they might be relevant to your own research. What are some examples of primary sources that are correspondent? Uh, so for example, if you're studying the Spanish conquest, uh, you might want to look at Spanish conquistador letters uh, that they're either sending to each other uh, or to the king. So there's a published primary source, Hernán Cortés's uh, letters that he wrote to the king. There's also famously, right, uh, the letter that Abigail Adams wrote to John Adams, you know, where she famously tells him to remember the ladies. Another thing you might want to consider for correspondence, right, is maybe uh, if, you're, if you're studying warfare, maybe you might find letters written from soldiers to their family members. Or an example that I mentioned in uh, one of my classes is this book, Tejanos and Gray, Civil War Letters of Captains Joseph Rafael de la Garza 
and Manuel Iturri. And so this is about Mexican-American soldiers who fought in the Civil War. So this is accounts from those who served for the Confederacy. Okay, so now let's talk about examples of, let's say, diaries, memoirs, and also personal histories. So these could include, in the context of uh, colonial Mexican history, uh, accounts uh, of the Spanish conquest uh, from the Spanish soldiers who witnessed them. Uh, in the context of colonial U.S. history, this could also probably mean, for example, accounts of slavery from uh, former um, from former enslaved Africans and African Americans. Uh, so, for example, the most well-known uh, history of the conquest of the Americas, written from a Spaniard, is uh, by uh, Bartolomé de las Casas, who wrote his text uh, that we know in English, a short account of the destruction of the Indies, where you know he was highlighting you know the brutality uh, of the Spanish conquest and sort of as a, as a counter to Bartolomé de las Casas, uh, you had another person who was also on the ground uh, during the conquest, which was uh, Bernal Díaz del Castillo, who wrote his text in English is known as the true history of the conquest of New Spain. And so notably just justifying uh, the nature of the Spanish conquest, you know, arguing the brutality also of, of the indigenous uh, Mexica empire and highlighting, for the lack of a better term, right, uh, what he seems to frame as the barbarity uh, of the indigenous peoples they encountered. So another example of uh, personal histories um, that are our primary source materials also because, again, these are written from the perspective of people who were there when they occurred. Uh, another popular example of, um, of personal histories and diaries uh, is uh, the text Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl by Harriet Jacobs. I love assigning this text for the, uh, my U.S. history students. Uh, also useful about this text, you know, is that it does specifically, you know, it, it does give us examples of some of the hardships that uh, enslaved uh, African-American women went through. What about oral history interviews? So for starters, these could be oral history interviews that you conduct uh, with, with subjects who are directly related to the event. For example, I have some of my students who are doing oral history interviews of family members. Those do count, right, as, uh, as primary sources for constructing those sorts of family histories. Uh, for those who are not interviewing close family members, Another uh, source that you might want to look at are these oral history repositories online. One that I'm sort of been pitching to my classes because they've been doing a lot of amazing work uh, is the Black and Brown Oral History Project. I happen to know uh, someone who was uh, involved in the interview process uh, for, who was doing the interviews for uh, some of these folks uh, in South Texas. Uh, to take a look at what they have available in the website. You know, as you see, they have oral histories divided into different categories uh, that are relevant to some of the things we're studying in our classes, such as, you know, for example, uh, black and white race relations. Uh, there's also Anglo-Mexican relations. Uh, there's community organizations and things of that nature uh, that may be relevant to your own topic. Uh, famously, right, there's also, some of you might have learned about uh, the WPA's uh, interviews of um, former enslaved uh, African Americans. And so, um, and of Grant said, right, there's many other uh, useful oral history interviews that the WPA did, you know, so for example, they have interviews also of uh, Native American groups who were among, uh, among those who had just recently been put uh, into the reservation system. Uh, and so uh, that's, um, or, who has, who, or who had family members who were among uh, the first to be put into the reservation system. So some of these interviews, right, might be of interest for those of you all who are studying uh, indigenous peoples uh, in the U.S. The only thing that you would have to, of course, double check is to see what, uh, which of these collections that they have, uh, if whether or not they're accessible digitally, or if you would have to go to, of course, uh, physically uh, to, uh, to the Library of Congress, which I, again, right, I know it's in the middle of the semester. I don't think anyone can go all the way to Washington, D.C., so I would strongly suggest instead you know, looking to see what you can access digitally by looking at this website. Uh, I also want to talk about the Bracero Oral History Project. So I happen to know about this project uh, because I was, I used to work for the Institute uh, of Oral History uh, at UTEP. And so I knew about this uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Yolanda Chavez Leva. You can go to the website here, um, just Google search it, Bracero Oral History Project uh, and UTEP. And you'll find that you could see, for example, the entire transcript uh, of the interview, and you can even listen to the original interview uh, as well. Okay, so you could download it and you don't need, for example, uh, UTEP credentials uh, or credentials of a UTEP student. 
you don't need that to access them. Okay, anyone can access them. So for those of you all who are interested in learning some of the uh, oral histories of the folks who were part of the, uh, what was essentially the, uh, the guest worker program where the US invited workers from Mexico to work the fields during the World War II period, uh, you can learn more about them uh, through these uh, interviews of former braceros. Okay, so let's talk about newspaper accounts. Uh, so first of all, when you are uh, looking at newspaper accounts for a particular time period, ideally the news, not ideally the newspapers you should be identifying, right, should pertain, should have been published in the time period that you're studying. Uh, so for example, if you're studying the U.S. war with Mexico, uh, you should ideally be looking at newspapers uh, covering this uh, around this time period. Uh, so things published in 1846 to 1848. Uh, you can definitely find uh, newspapers uh, on this subject right in the Library of Congress website. Uh, other examples that I have here, uh, perhaps you might want to look at um, a newspaper coverage uh, from one specific newspaper, such as the Los Angeles Times. Uh, I know that there's uh, some who have commented on how the LA Times, for example, was very critical uh, and if not hostile uh, in its coverage of uh, the Chicano movement uh, protests in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, and in this case, right, they're referring to the uh, Chicano moratorium that protests against the Vietnam War in East LA. Uh, they refer to it as a riot here, even though it was the police uh, who, uh, who initiated the violence here. But uh, anyways, that's for another topic. Um, or for those of you who are interested in following sort of these anti-immigrant uh, campaigns, one of the most famous being uh, Operation Wetback, uh, which was one of these uh, campaigns of mass deportation that didn't just take place in LA, but other parts of the US as well. What about political zines and uh, political propaganda? I have some folks uh, in some of my classes who are looking at, for example, anarchist newspapers, feminist newspapers and zines uh, published in Mexico. An example that I have listed here, right, is uh, Regeneración, uh, which you can find uh, various copies of it uh, online. And this is just one example. Or perhaps you're, you're interested in looking at World War II propaganda posters, whether that's in the U.S. Uh, or in Russia, for example. Uh, or maybe, you know, if you're studying something like the protest movements in the 1960s, maybe you may want to look at the gay liberation movement posters or other posters, depending on which uh, time period you are studying. And of course, there's other political propaganda and zines that you could potentially look at uh, that are more sinister in nature. Uh, so for those of you all who are studying maybe topics related to xenophobia, uh, let's say, for example, uh, in Europe, you might want to look at Nazi propaganda. Uh, if you're looking at uh, xenophobic rhetoric and propaganda here in the US, maybe you might want to look at uh, KKK advertisements or perhaps some of these posters and propaganda from the nativist group uh, known as the Know Nothing Party. How can we use artwork uh, as a primary source? So if you want to look at the uh, early colonial period in Mexico and you want to look at how are indigenous people writing about the subject of homosexuality, the various authors have looked at some of the images in the Florentine Codex. So as you can see here in the upper left-hand corner, this image is supposed to depict someone uh, who is accused of homosexual sodomy uh, being burnt alive. Uh, and there has been some debate uh, in the academic literature as to whether or not this was actually a practice that they engaged in, uh, or was this something that they were telling uh, the Spanish officials that they were doing uh, in order for them to believe that they were uh, that similar to the Spanish, that they also cracked down on uh, what was referred to as homosexual sodomy. Other ways to think about artworks and how you might want to use them uh, for a research paper Perhaps you might want to look at uh, artwork that was made during a specific time period and how, maybe how that was used for nationalist influences. So, for example, I mentioned here Jesus Alguera, uh, who was a famous painter, uh, and many uh, associate Jesus Alguera for, for inspiring Mexican nationalism that's uh, known as Mexicanidad. Uh, the last example I have here, right, is comic books. During the World War II period, you had a lot of these patriotic comic books. So. Uh, this is just an example, right, of how you might want to explore different themes within visual material. So how would you use literature and film from a time period you're studying as a primary source? So you could kind of look at maybe how do these um, films or literary sources, how do re they reflect the anxieties of relating to the historical topic uh, in question. So for example, uh, some folks have written on how this anime, Barefoot Gen, 
how it depicts uh, sort of this frustration and this uh, reflection on the horrors of the dropping of the atomic bomb in uh, Hiroshima. And uh, another example we have here is uh, this, uh, the novel of the underdogs, uh, which is on the Mexican Revolution. Uh, many authors and historians have pointed out how this sort of reflects this uh, frustration with the revolution uh, as this horrific never-ending event. And uh, as far as literary uh, sources such as Jose Vasconcelos' text La Raza Cosmica, folks has, have studied this text more looking at it from the perspective of shifting ideas of nationalism in Mexico. Other things you might want to consider are what about legislation or legal records? I know I've had some students who've used the U.S. Constitution examining that to see who was that was not excluded. Uh, you also have publications of the Black Codes. Uh, you could probably examine those uh, if you're trying to do more of a thorough examination of how uh, segregation was enforced in the South. And also for those of you all who are studying perhaps uh, human sexuality uh, or anti-sodomy laws in the U.S., uh, you might be able to find excerpts of these laws. For example, I found this passage in the National Archives. And uh, what about court records and legal proceedings? So uh, going back to the early colonial Spanish period, uh, we do have uh, some pr published primary sources uh, detailing uh, um, some of these uh, court records from the time. Uh, so for example, on the left here, we have uh, a Spanish language translation of the execution, of the trial and execution of the uh, uh, the last ruler of the uh, indigenous peoples of, of Michoacan, which is who was known as the Galsonzi. The records of his trial are here as well. Uh, maybe you might want to look at uh, published primary sources that have uh, a series of um, trial documents. So uh, an example I have here is uh, this text, Spanish Colonial Women and the Law, uh, written by, uh, edited, I'm sorry, by uh, Linda Tigues. Uh, and so this again, right, if you're interested in looking at the New Mexico region uh, and want some primary source documents, uh, this will probably be the book you will want to look at. Uh, again, you might also want to look at interviews uh, and specifically these might not be what we would refer to as oral history interviews, but uh, these could also include perhaps uh, in, uh, news uh, media outlet interviews, maybe interrogations. You know, so for example, there's interviews of Cesar Chavez, uh, the leader of the UFW that you might be able to find in online video databases. Uh, there's definitely walk interrogations that you could get a hold of uh, as well uh, in both video and in printed format. Uh, and for the students that I have who are um, looking at, uh, uh, who are listening to the Forgotten Women of Juarez podcast, I am allowing folks to use the interviews for family members of, of the deceased. Um, I'm allowing them to use these interviews as part of their primary sources. Also think about speeches. Sometimes speeches are printed, some of them are not printed. There's also uh, Calhoun's infamous uh, speech on the war with Mexico. Um, and for those who have taken my uh, US and Mexican history courses, uh, this, they know that this is a fun read. Um, or perhaps, right, uh, if you're interested in politics, right, maybe George Washington's farewell address might be uh, useful. And uh, if you're interested in studying the history, right, of feminism uh, in the U.S., perhaps you might want to read Sojourner Truth's uh, Anti a Woman speech. Or maybe, right, if you want to get a sense of what Frederick Douglass's sentiments are, right, on Fourth of July celebrations, uh, while slavery is still uh, a legal institution in the U.S., you should definitely check out his Fourth of July speech. I also have some folks who are looking at uh, political cartoons uh, for their papers. So some are looking at some of the racist cartoons uh, and depictions uh, by, uh, that were drawn by Dr. Seuss, uh, especially during the World War II era, and even some that uh, date before the World War II era. Um, and um, also uh, some folks who have been looking at uh, some of the, uh, uh, some of this, uh, I guess you could say, a uh, pro-manifest destiny uh, propaganda, right? And so here it shows the U.S. integrating uh, on the bottom right, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, the Philippines, and Cuba, right? And you see that they're depicted as these sort of these stubborn, dark um, children, right? So again, depicting this sort of racist notion of, uh, of the so-called white man's burden. And again, I think this is a self-explanatory one. Uh, think about maybe how you might want to elaborate on the images that you've, you collect or that you see in photographs. Uh, so I have some folks looking at Chicano movement photographs, 
Uh, I've had students in the past use uh, photographs of Japanese internment camp life. Perhaps some folks might want to look at the Vietnam War photographs for those who are interested in that topic. Those who are doing oral history interviews of families or, or of immigrant narratives that you all might want to include, for example, uh, family photographs as well as part of your primary sources that you collect. What about examples of videos as primary sources? So maybe some of you might get a hold of U.S. Uh, War Department footage where, for example, they might be justifying right, uh, the internment of Japanese uh, Americans. Perhaps some of you who are studying the civil rights movement uh, might be looking at the images and videos of uh, the protests, right, and perhaps maybe the sit-ins. And uh, for those of you who are studying history of television, Maybe you might want to look at uh, some of this uh, old game show footage uh, as, uh, as, a pri as a potential primary source. Okay, so what about artifacts? Uh, when we think about art artifacts, we might be thinking about pottery, uh, but uh, we can also think about, for example, uh, cave paintings uh, or maybe uh, hieroglyphics, for example. Pointing to some examples that I have mentioned here, scholars who have studied uh, homosexuality in ancient cultures, for example, uh, have looked, for example, at Roman pottery, at uh, Mochica artworks in South America that depict uh, homosexuality as well. Uh, some folks have looked at uh, Mayan cave paintings and also what is believed to be evidence of, of a same-sex male Egyptian couple. And you could perhaps also think about uh, objects that maybe you've encountered in museum exhibits. Okay, so what is a secondary source? Let's go back to Furman University. Uh, here they state uh, in that same page that I had shared earlier that secondary sources are closely related to primary sources and often interpret them. These sources are documents that relate to information that originated elsewhere. Secondary sources often use generalizations, analysis, interpretations, and synthesis of primary sources. Examples of secondary sources include textbooks, articles, and reference books. Now, I want to emphasize that in academia, we ask for scholarly peer-reviewed secondary sources. And so this includes journal articles, books, textbooks, book chapters, master's thesis, uh, theses, I should say, and dissertations. Uh, for some classes that I have that are not strictly history courses, I do allow exceptions to this rule. But for all of my history-related courses, I do ask for all of your secondary sources to be scholarly peer-reviewed sources. Before continuing, I want to clarify what does not constitute a scholarly or peer-reviewed source. Uh, for starters, right, newspaper articles that offer contemporary perspectives or opinions on past events, right, these are not secondary sources that are scholarly or peer-reviewed. Might be secondary, but it's not scholarly, not peer-reviewed. The same goes for articles from CNN, Fox News, or any other media station. Uh, blogs or opinion pieces, another example of uh, sources that are secondary, but they are not scholarly, not peer-reviewed. Uh, for that matter, all web articles, blog posts, newspapers, or sources from .com websites, these are not scholarly, secondary, peer-reviewed sources. Uh, There's some examples where newspapers are, are primary sources, yes, uh, they're not not scholarly, peer-reviewed, secondary sources. Some common examples I've seen in many of my classes is folks using examples from history.com, uh, you know, or from Bremescla, uh, or the Zen History Project. Again, while they do have some articles that might relate to our disciplines, right, uh, again, these are not scholarly peer-reviewed sources. As uh, my girl Cardi B says, So what makes a, a secondary source scholarly and peer-reviewed? When we say that a source is peer-reviewed, it means that it's likely gone through some sort of a peer review process among other academics or publishers. And usually these are works that are published in an academic journal or published by a university press. So for example, uh, some journals I'm thinking about are the Journal of American History, for example, the Journal of Ethnohistory, uh, the University of Texas Press, University of California Press. Uh, and uh, as we have pictured here, right, some examples of these journals are the International Labor uh, and working class uh, history journal or the journal of asian american studies uh, and so granted there are exceptions to this rule right uh, where sometimes you have scholarly rigorous work uh, outside of uh, what's mentioned here uh, but the point here is is that you your work should have uh, some scholarly rigor and that brings me to this next question so what makes the source academic uh, so usually these uh, refer to sources or articles, right, that are written by academics, or this is work that's published by an academic press. So as you see here, these uh, these two journals, right, uh, 
Uh, this one, the International Labor and Working Class History, uh, it's hosted by Cambridge University Press, uh, for example. These works, they have credibility because they went through this peer review process. And granted, not all the books that we typically use in academia are always written by academics. Uh, and they're not always published by academic presses. Uh, but the point here is that, that you are using sources that are written by someone who is reliable. Uh, we're hoping that you're not going to, for example, uh, cite a work that's written by someone who is claiming that aliens from outer space uh, were responsible for the entire outcome of historical events uh, in the world. Okay. Another way to decipher uh, whether or not a source is academic, think about if uh, this source, think about who the audience is. If it's a magazine article from National Geographic or Forbes magazine, um, those are uh, articles that are usually written for general audiences. These are not uh, articles that are written for uh, academics or uh, researchers. So in that case, right, if you come across an, a reading like that, the chances are that it's not an academic or peer-reviewed source. Personally, I like this graphic provided by Angelo State University on how to recognize a scholarly or peer-reviewed article. Uh, so uh, in this T-chart they see here, right, so for example, they put in contrast a popular magazine with scholarly journals. So with popular magazines, do you see a reference list at the end? No, right? Usually you don't. Scholarly journals, yes, you do. Uh, popular magazines, right? It's usually flashy covers, photographs, advertisements. You don't see this in scholarly journals, right? Maybe you might see some ads but and some graphs and some charts, but uh, it most, mostly looks pretty boring, right? Article lengths, right? Popular magazines, they tend to be very short, whereas scholarly articles, journal articles, they tend to be long. Uh, the audience, right, for popular magazines, uh, they're tailored to the general public, right? So they don't use, uh, you know, they won't use theoretical frameworks. You know, they won't talk about, uh, they often stray from controversial topics. Uh, whereas scholarly journals, they will be tailored to students, professionals, and researchers. Uh, and popular magazines, right? So who's writing these articles? These tend to be staff writers, right? These are not people that are necessarily professionals in the topic that they're writing about. Uh, whereas in scholarly journals, these are folks, these are practitioners, these are theorists, these are educators. And in popular magazines, another thing we see, right, is that the titles tend to be short and catchy. Whereas in scholarly journals, they're very long, very precise. Last but not least, with the publisher of popular magazines, they tend to be very commercial. Whereas scholarly journals, these are published, right, by an educational institution. Uh, as I mentioned before, right, like Stanford University Press, uh, journals that are published by professional associations like the Journal of Ethnohistory, which is by the, uh, by the Historical Society for Ethnohistory. So again, I want to cover what is considered a scholarly peer-reviewed source. I often have folks that will confuse magazines, web articles, or newspaper reports as peer-reviewed scholarly sources. So again, um, I know I sound like a broken record here, but these are not scholarly peer-reviewed sources since they are not meant for academic audiences. It's not a reliable source. So uh, what is an, uh, in the scholarly peer-reviewed sense? Uh, the University of New England Library website describes that, quote, uh, these peer-reviewed scholarly sources, that are research articles published in scholarly journals. A research article is a report on original research written by the researchers with an audience of other researchers in mind. This is how experts in academic fields report their findings to one another and build knowledge based on previous research. So how can you tell if your journal is scholarly? You can follow the steps that are mentioned here to investigate if a journal is peer-reviewed, but I don't wanna take too much time explaining that process here and I don't want you all to spend too much time doing this either. My simple answer is instead of doing this process that's mentioned here on this slide, just use, uh, just limit your database search to only peer-reviewed journal articles only. And you can do this using the university library's uh, search databases, you know, and you can use them to easily tell if a source is peer-reviewed or not. Uh, so for example, uh, most universities now are using the OneSearch tool. Uh, and this, uh, the OneSearch tool allows you to narrow down your search to peer-reviewed journal articles only. Uh, and notably, Google Scholar does this for you as well. So for example, here, this is uh, the one search for uh, one of the other institutions I work for, Cal State Dominguez Hills. Uh, as you can see, you can also help narrow down your search terms here on this navigation pane to the left. 
Uh, you can look at specifically just peer-reviewed scholarly sources by just checking that checkbox there. And you can also even narrow it down by books. Uh, you can also check the box for articles. You can check the box for book chapters and theses and dissertations. So where can you go to find scholarly peer-reviewed sources, right? So I mentioned OneSearch just now. Uh, another thing that I do want to point out is that you can also sometimes find entire digital versions of books uh, on OneSearch as well. Uh, and um, you can also, of course, look for scholarly peer-reviewed sources in your university library. Uh, pretty much everything that's in the university library it will count, right? Um, another thing you might want to use if you haven't considered this yet uh, is Google Scholar. And the reason why I like to push Google Scholar uh, to many of my students is that this has happened to me, for example, where I, I'm looking for a source and I'm using search terms on, on OneSearch and um, I get more sources on Google Scholar than I do uh, on OneSearch sometimes. So what I like to do sometimes is, uh, let's say if I'm on Google Scholar and I find an article name that I didn't find uh, on OneSearch. So sometimes what I like to do is copy and paste the name of the article or book that I found on Google Scholar and I'll type it into OneSearch. And almost always, sure enough, it does pop up. Uh, and if it's not there, uh, I will use the interlibrary loan system uh, by the university library to request the book or article. Uh, and usually interlibrary loan does give you, they will uh, provide the text for you in most cases. Okay, and if you're requesting an article or book chapter, uh, chances are that they might be able to send it to you electronically, okay, instead of you having to have a physical copy uh, of that source. Another tip that I have on scholarly peer-reviewed sources uh, is that you might also want to consider some of the assigned readings that maybe were already covered in class or in your, some of your other previous classes. Uh, so for example, I personally, I do allow students to use uh, the assigned readings from our class uh, as part of their research papers. I know every faculty member is different, so uh, that's just for me, but make sure that you check in with your professors on their policies regarding that. Um, you might even want to include an article that you've read for a different class that maybe relates to your research paper. Uh, so again, uh, that's just something to consider. Think about maybe uh, scholarly sources that you already read and are just sort of recycling or implementing for this paper. Now, another unsung source here that I do like to preach to my students is archive.org. I cannot tell you how many times I've found entire books and sometimes primary sources on archive.org. Uh, the cool thing about archive.org is that you can get digital access to books that are uh, sometimes out of print or whose copyright expired long a long time ago. Uh, so take advantage of this, if, especially if you're trying to look at older books and if you want to get a sense of how um, uh, academics or scholars right, have uh, interpreted certain historical events uh, in earlier time periods. Uh, and so, uh, and honestly, I, I will say I have even encountered primary sources on here. So again, you know, think about this as a possible resource, right? I, I found primary source readers on archive.org uh, as well. So here are my closing tips on conducting your primary uh, and secondary source uh, research. Uh, as you are uh, thinking about and listing all these different uh, potential sources you might want to use for your final paper or final project, uh, I advise you to list all your secondary sources that you're planning to use. Um, you know, keep track of them because sometimes you might come across something that uh, you, uh, let's say somewhere down the line later on, you're like, oh, well, actually that was a good article. I wish I would have saved it or I wish I would have remembered what it was called. Uh, and now you can't access it anymore. So again, keep track of it, even if it's something that maybe you were thinking of using, but you weren't sure. Uh, perhaps it's something that you could come back to later. Uh, and again, right, as you're coming up with your list of potential secondary sources and primary sources, uh, keep a list, right? Don't skip this step, right? And make sure that you have both primary and secondary sources because again, right, if, you, if you're missing one or the other, uh, you're not gonna have enough material to help you write your paper. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've had students with awesome ideas for research papers or awesome ideas for projects, but a problem is, is that either they don't have the primary sources available to write the paper or they don't have enough secondary sources to help them write their papers. Uh, so uh, again, just note that uh, another tip that I have is uh, I do not expect you to read your sources in their entirety when you're in the process of picking them out. So uh, 
uh, when you're thinking about your sources, you know, skim read them. But more, most importantly, I would say, you know, pay attention to the titles, read the abstracts if they're journal articles or skim read the introductions uh, if they're book chapters or books. But again, right, I don't expect you as you're in this research process of choosing your sources to read them in their entirety just yet. OK, just get a sense of what they're about and judge whether or not you think they may or may not be relevant uh, to your final project or paper. Okay, so that's it for now. Uh, and thank you all for tuning in. Uh, if y'all have any other questions, you know how to get a hold of me via email or, or through Canvas or Blackboard, whichever system y'all are using. Thank you.